this is Nicky Horn, and with me now on Live from London is Steve Marriott. Steve, Hello, mate. welcome. It's Thanks. good to see you. Yeah. Let me start, if I may, talking about your early career, because uh, you started life uh, as a, a child actor. Um, can you tell us how, how you got involved in all that? My mum got me involved in that. Uh, I used to, I had a ukulele. I used to sort of uh, play skiff or whatever. I was only a nipper about that at all. Well, I haven't got much bigger now. <laughs> Makes two but, yeah. <laughs> just to go around the bus queues begging or uh, any, anywhere I could, you know. And um, it came to light afterwards that Lionel, Lionel Bart, who wrote the show, Oliver, which I was auditioning for, had actually seen me do all that. And uh, while well, waiting for his bus, no doubt. I've no, I've no idea. Uh, but Lionel told me later that he knew all about it. And uh, there's, some, there's some, something to do with my family as well that he knew of that I didn't know anything about. Went for the audition. Done, old boy, and uh, and uh, that was a, that was a, my new hobby had just begun. <laughs> that was it. Because you, you then became the Artful Dodger in Oliver, and well, you, you were you were going to uh, <clears throat> the Italia Conti, which is a, a theatrical school. No, well, I, no, listen, I'm not posh. The only reason I, I did that was because my school burnt down, uh, which I got the blame for. <laughs> my mother still got the cuttings from that, but um, I had no choice. I had to go to a drama school. But it was why, good though, why? because no, no other school would have you. That's right. No, that's right. Because uh, there's a little picture of me dressed as the Artful Dodger. There's little Chicago Burns in the Stratford Express, and that was my lot. And the thing, the thing that was good though, I was, I was one of the rough kids there because uh, Italia Conti is full of rejects, like eating rejects, or uh, you know, walk around with plums in their mouth, and they don't really do a lot. But uh, someone like me that was working all the time to pay his fees off, I was working all the time, so you get petty jealousies. Uh, we used to beat all these posh kids up for their sweets. You know, it was a me and a geezer from Tulse Hill, and we were the sweets. You know, and uh, they'd, ha they'd have to, of course. A great training ground, obviously, for, for going into rock and roll. So, mm. how did you start in, in music? What led you to from the stage to music? Well, um, I got fed up with it. Uh, I mean, it's all right when you're a, a kid acting, you know what I mean? But not much of a future in it. Um, I was hip enough at that age to see when I was 16, I was going to be in a lot of trouble, or 17, because there's a lot of kids are that. When you're 13, 12, and you've got a lot of mouth or whatever, you can get these sort of parts. Uh, they're written for you, but um, I, I could see a lot of trouble, and I was already, you know, messing about with little bands like the Moonlights doing Shadow Steps and all that sort of stuff. Well, I tried to turn them onto Muddy Waters, and <laughs> not, not much effect at that point in time. Yeah. But, um, and that's, that's about it. I just got fed up with acting. I really did. So I'm hanging the, about the sets for hours on end. So the Small Faces, where does that come? I mean, how did you get involved with them? Uh, well, um, <laughs> I got them fired from the band they were in. See, uh, 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 Ronnie Lane, uh, I used to work in a music shop in the East End. Ronnie Lane came in and uh, I sold him a bass, met him, met his dad. And he said, why don't you come and have a sing with us? I said, I'm a singer, out of work singer. Usual load of wallop, you know. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he, um, he, we went down some pub in uh, Bermondsey that night, but the, his band was called The Outcast. They were quite good. Kenny Jones was in that band, mm. Ronnie and Kenny. And they had a regular gig at this Bermondsey pub. Well, me thinking I was Jerry Lee Marriott, started on the piano, and ended up jumping on it and smashing it. Conse consequently, they all got fired. They, they didn't have a gig no more. And the band broke up because of that, mm. see? So it was my fault again, but uh, Ronnie and Kenny said, that, well, might as well stick with him, he's caused a problem. <laughs> One of those things. But the Small Faces, uh, the success came, it seems, relatively quickly to the Small Faces. Uh, Tin Soldier, Ichiku Park, uh, the immediate label, I mean, the, 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 the explosion, the music explosion yeah. was then happening. Did you feel as if you were part of, you know, that British movement at that time, which was oh, yeah. terribly strong? Yeah, we were. There's no doubt about it. Although, uh, at the time, we were a bit too intoxicated by it to realise what was going on. I mean, only in retrospect can you see it was a, a whole British explosion or movement or what have you. At the time, you know, you were too busy trying to sort of think of what you could record next or yeah. seeing if Ronnie could write the next single or something. You didn't really analyse it too much. How did success change you? I mean, what life before? Well, what I was stopped that going like? to Woolworths and I went to British home stores. That's, <laughs> a, that's about it. It didn't, I don't think it really did. It frightened me. You know, I mean, it, how? Uh, well, when you've had a few drinks and whatever, and you're playing like this, and there's a bunch of kids all squashed up against wire mesh fences screaming at you, that frightens you. Because it's got nothing to do with really what you wanted to do. What you wanted to do was play music and be, have appreciation for that instead of your bum wiggling which is basically what it was all about, all the little girls. Once the geezers go off you, yeah, the little girls come onto you, and that's frightening because all of a sudden then you're doing gigs where bouncers are wearing knuckle dusters and punching little girls in a mush and all that. Uh, that's, there's a frightening aspect to it. That it, wasn't, it frightened us anyway. I think our feet were on the ground. Mm. It wasn't as if, uh, as if we were, got carried away by it. And we couldn't have a go at these big geezers for doing it, or they'd hit us and all carried away in a moment. Right. You know? Well, then, of course, there, there was Humble Pie, which was an enormous success, especially in America. Mm. 
that's where you really broke. What was it like in those early days going to the States as being part of the, the seminal sort of British work. band? It was hard work, there was no doubt about it. I mean, you didn't go over there on the crest of a wave. In fact, we went over there and come in the back door, third on the bill, uh, uh, little dives and what have you, you know, and watching great acts, really great acts like Santana when they first formed and um, uh, Johnny Winter when he was first having a go. And, uh, we came in through that back door and had to work our way up, um, uh, which I think is the best way we, we could have done it. Mm. Uh, see, we were being called a super group uh, at the time, and we'd had one hit record, I think, Natural Born was name, and, and that was it. You know, we thought, we, well, if we carry on like this, there's only one place for us to go, and it's down, because uh, we didn't have to work our way up. Do you, do you understand? Yeah. It, was, yeah. uh, it was taken. It was a super group, bloody blue, and we all know how long that lasts. So uh, we literally went to America to earn our... Uh, make our bones, if you like, mm. and become a band. We didn't even know if, if we were any good. You know what I mean? Beating that record, we didn't need <laughs> We didn't warrant it, you know, so uh, we went over there and, and did some hard slog. Mm. Now, you must, you must have stories about some of the gigs that you've done in the States. I mean, some <laughs> of the far-flung places. Oh, yeah, there's some far-flung places, all right. I, I, one, of the, one of the horriblest stories was with the U. Uh, but, but this was in the, in the faces. Um, uh, in New Zealand, we got a little uncontrollable. And uh, <clears throat> I, think, I think it was my 21st birthday, as it happens, in New Zealand, and, um, and they brought the police in to control us in the hotel because we'd gone a bit divvy. And um, we ended up playing, you know, I'll tell you how it started. We had a little record player EMI had given to me, and it didn't work. It fed back into itself, so Mooney aimed it out the window. <laughs> see? So Wiggy, John Wolfe, who, yeah. who then worked for you, ran down the stairs, got it back up all in its bits, and out it went again. Everything followed it out the window. So uh, I'm giving you an example of how out of, of order it was. Um, uh, so uh, EMI yeah, gave me a big set up then, because obviously <laughs> I was unhappy with a little one. <laughs> they gave me a big one and uh, book a tea like we're going for it. And the police come in, we've got their helmets on, they're, um, you know, as a noop. And they bring the army in after that because the police can't control us. I mean, they're enjoying themselves. <laughs> so they bring the army in with bolt loaders outside everyone's door. You look, get back in that door, sonny. Um, did that. And uh, in the meantime, I bought uh, a, a lovely Gibson. It must have been the only Gibson in New Zealand. Lovely guitar it was. And the toe rags had it sp sprayed pink with gold lame Marriott on the top. <laughs> so I couldn't use it, so I let Townsend smash it that <laughs> night. No stories like that, but I mean, they're, they're not very clever, but they were fun at the time. Of course. I mean, rock and roll for you, I think, has always been fun. I mean, it hasn't actually lost no, its appeal, has no, it? No, never. No, well, I, it's, all I, it's all I do. And if you can't, if you can't uh, take the mickey out yourself, and, uh, and other people, if they can't take it, I'm sorry, but they're quite welcome to have a go at me and all. Well, so let's talk about, you know, your, your current band that you've got that we're about to see. Packet of Free? Yeah, Packet Well, you know I'm not taking it too serious. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't explain that joke to people out, uh, <laughs> in Europe and the and other far-flown places. But, I mean, you, you're, you're still working very hard. Yeah. Um, the band is, is getting very good reviews. Mm. I mean, do you ever see yourself just going on stage one day and saying, I can't take this anymore? No. That's it. The only way I could do that, if, if you were surrounded by people that weren't interested, if, you were, if the band itself were mercenary, or, uh, you know, that we're only, only doing it for the money, which, uh, you know, the people that, 99% uh, of the people I've ever worked with aren't like that. They do it because they enjoy it as much as me, and that's the, co the, co the camaraderie that comes out of it. Mm. Um, that would be the way. If the people themselves went into it, of course, I'd start this and I'd put my guitar down, that'd be that, but I'd go and form another band, wouldn't I? <laughs> You know, I mean, that's the way you do it. Well, as far as rock and roll is concerned, you've, you've done more than most. Is there any ambition that you still have left? Oh, I haven't really got any. I'll be honest with you. I haven't really got any. The bit of ambition is not in my mouth. You know what I mean? But what I would like to do is hang about a bit longer and uh, continue doing what I'm doing so I'm still having fun at it. And, and hopefully um, there'll be some youngsters that can look at it and maybe get something off of it. You know, I mean, that's a, not a too big any way of looking at it, but you must have something to offer them. Yeah. You know, uh, whether it's uh, lessons in vocal or guitar or good drummers or, or whatever. I mean, Jerry Shirley, who's playing with, uh, with me at the moment, uh, has uh, been with me for years. I mean, he's one of the best there is. So mm. if there's a young aspiring drummer, while that guy's on the stage, you can still look and see what's going on. That's the thing. And once us old, old sods get lost in the shuffle, it's a shame. You know? yeah. Well, rock and roll is still alive and well in yeah. Steve Marriott, and congratulations on just becoming a daddy oh, for the time, second mate. time. <laughs> Thank you. Steve, best of luck to you. Thank you, Nicky. Thanks a lot.
Greg song for Sam. Humble Pie song. Uh, yeah. Got a big nose, this mic, isn't it? And uh, uh, Jerry, the drummer, helped me write it. It's uh, called I'm a Fool for a Pretty Face, and I hope you like it. Hey, one, two, three, four. <laughs>
this old Jimmy Reed tune for you. All right, mate. Look, that beard and half look nice. Can I have a bit? Here we go. <laughs>
the pity for